uh, kindly request everybody to switch off their videos. <laughs> Yes, sir. So it's almost seven thirty. So, sir, sir, we'll uh, start uh, now. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Saravandi, uh, I'm audible to you. Yes. Okay. Okay, sir. Sure. So, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, today's session. So, we have with us uh, today's uh, speaker, Professor Kamal Saravandi. Uh, who is a pioneer in various uh, areas of electromagnetics, applied electromagnetics. So today uh, he'll be giving a talk on uh, my research journey in applied electromagnetics uh, based on his wide teaching and research uh, expertise. So thank you, Professor Sarabandi, for uh, taking uh, time from your busy schedule and being with us. So yeah, so and also we have uh, Professor Bhatin Ghosh uh, from Department of Electronics and uh, Electrical Communication, IIT Kharagpur, uh, who has a high uh, expertise in uh, field of computational electromagnetics, uh, along with antenna uh, development research. So, uh, I would uh, like to ask Professor uh, Ghosh to introduce uh, our today's speaker, and after that, uh, speaker will be uh, starting today's session. Uh, but before that, I have some small announcement for attendees. So all attendees, uh, kindly uh, mute your uh, mic uh, while uh, a session is going on. And also, uh, for if you have any queries, you can uh, type in the chat box. Or uh, we'll, and also we'll be having a Q&A uh, session at the end of our talk. So that time, uh, that uh, queries will be um, at, uh, answered. And uh, also, uh, I'm sharing uh, the attendance sheet uh, for today's session. So I request all the attendees to uh, kindly fill the attendance form. So yeah, so profession, uh, prof, uh, Professor Ghosh, uh, I'll ha hand over to you. Thank you, Prajakta. Uh, we indeed are fortunate to welcome uh, Professor Kamal Sarabandi uh, to deliver this evening's talk. <laughs> to our uh, research and teaching faculties at our institute and all over India, <clears throat> as well as the student participants. <clears throat> Professor Sarabandi's name requires little introduction to anyone in the antennas and electromagnetics, uh, the applied electromagnetics community. Uh, <clears throat> he's, uh, besides uh, his uh, immense accomplishments in this field, he, he has been uh, directing different organizations and he has he's one of the most cited authors in the field of applied electromagnetics and uh, he has worked in numerous areas in this uh, in this field so i would just introduce uh, him with a short biography <coughs> uh, professor sarabandi is currently director of the radiation laboratory and the rafas s teasdale endowed professor of engineering in the department of electrical engineering and computer science <coughs> over the over the past 30 years his research has been on applied electromagnetics and has made significant contributions to science and technology of microwave and millimeter wave radar systems microwave remote sensing metamaterials antennas communication channel modeling and microwave sensors he has graduated 54 phd and supervised he has served as the principal investigator on many projects sponsored by a large number of government agencies or industries. <clears throat> he led the Center for Microelectronics and Sensors sponsored by the Army Research Laboratory under the Micro Autonomous Systems and Technology, MAST, Collaborative Technology Alliance, CTA program from 2018. <clears throat> He is now leading a newly established center in microwave sensor technology funded by King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology, KACST. He has published many book chapters and more than 320 papers in refereed journals and more than 740 conference papers. 
Dr. Sarabandi served as a member of NASA Advisory Council appointed by the NASA Administrator 2006 to 2010 and served as the President of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society in 2015 and 2016. He is a recipient of many awards including the IEEE Judith A. Resnick Award, IEEE GRSS Distinguished Achievement Award, the University of Michigan Distinguished Achievement Award, Humboldt Research Award, NASA Group Achievement Award, and 34 paper awards. Professor Sarabandi is a fellow of IEEE, American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, and the National Academy of Inventors, NAI. So thank you, Professor Sarabandi, for accepting our invitation. So uh, I would uh, hand over to you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, everyone in India. Thank you, Professor Gersh, for a uh, nice introduction. Uh, it is always a pleasure to give talk to a group of students, young researchers such as yourself. Thank you for joining this talk. I wanted to uh, encourage all of you. This is a very interesting field to continue uh, your research in this field and make contribution as this is a very important field of research and of course is going to be an important field of research for many years to come. So let me see if I can present um, okay you see that yes sir okay so <clears throat> so the title of this talk as was announced is my research journey in applied electromagnetics uh, it was mentioned that i've been working in this field for many years and uh, as a result we have done quite a bit so i wanted to give you an overview of <clears throat> the field what is possible uh, what has been done and what is possible to do going into the future. So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history of electromagnetics and its application. Then, uh, Sorry, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, actually, your uh, slides are not uh, visible. Like, oh, okay. It, it, yeah. The slides are not visible or let me swap the display, see if it better. Is it better? Um, no? No, sir, no, sir. I would also request everybody to uh, uh, switch off their video, except of, of course, Professor Sarbandi. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm sharing my slides, but I don't know why it's not visible to you. Uh, you, can, you cannot see my screen? Uh, it is showing that you are presenting, but your screen is not uh, visible. Like your presentation is not visible. I no, no. Actually, what to do. Uh, your, uh, sorry. Uh, actually, your presentation is visible to me. I think it is visible to all of us. I think uh, there is some network connection to yours. I mean, the okay, presentation okay. Is to us. Yes. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. No problem. <laughs> all right. Okay. Because okay. uh, okay. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> if okay. That was the key. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the history of electromagnetics and its application. Then I'll switch to uh, one interesting application, actually, that attracted me to the field. And I chose to come to Michigan for my PhD at the time. And that had to do with radar remote sensing of environment and how we could use electromagnetics and our knowledge to address a very important issue at the time. We were talking about 1984. Most of you were not born uh, at the time. That the issue of global warming uh, was just getting traction and scientists were thinking about, you know, uh, such a thing is happening and the reasons uh, they postulated, but we didn't have any evidence for that. And um, I decided to work on this field 
uh, just to see, you know, if this is really true or not. And I'll talk a little bit about that, that I continued and I still work in this area after all these years because the problem is quite extensive and things that we can do to better understand our environment using electromagnetic can, can pay off. Uh, I also sorry, talk about... Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. There are many uh, comments that the slides are actually indeed not visible. It, it, it became visible to me once, but right now it's not visible to me as well. So I don't know. Oh. Uh, Okay, what do you suggest we do? I don't know. Uh, yes, sir. My... If possible, sir, you uh, stop presenting and then uh, try again. Like. Okay, so yeah. let me end go. Okay. Yeah, now, yeah, now it's visible, sir. Now it's visible. It now is it's visible. visible now in this format, huh? If I go to presentation mode, it's not visible, huh? I mean, it's okay with me. Uh, let me just do it like that because we don't want to take a lot of time. If you share the entire screen, then we can see the full presentation. If I do what? Uh, the entire screen. Actually, there is an option to share the entire screen. Uh, I did last time and that's why, you know, we got into trouble. Okay. Are you no using the sir. dual monitor, sir? Maybe that could be a... Uh, no issue, sir. We can uh, continue like this. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's uh, maybe better like this because that's what I did. I shared the screen and, and it just didn't work. Yeah. Sure, it's good. Uh, it's, it's, it's okay now. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so if I just maybe increase this a little bit. Uh, no, it doesn't. If I go to mode, it doesn't work. You cannot see this now? Uh, it is visible, sir, now. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what it was. Huh. It's okay, still okay, huh? Y yes, sir. Um, so, do you see the full screen or should I swap the uh, display? Uh, full screen, uh, maybe uh, it is fine. Like it, it, it is fine now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Tell me whether this is better or this is better. I think the previous one was please zoom out it. Yeah, please zoom it out. Okay. So I hear that this is better, right? Uh, yes. please uh, please zoom out a little bit. So okay. please zoom it out. Sir, please zoom it out. It's already in zoom view. Please back zoom. Uh, Professor okay. Sarabandi, I think the previous version was better. Because uh, uh, the, the, the here, some of the screen is not visible. The previous one was better. Is this better now? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so I'm not going to touch this again. All right, then uh, I'll also talk a little bit about the application of electromagnetics for security. In a specific, I talk about the application of the system for seeing through walls and being able to image for example, inside of a building from outside or inside the building from inside areas that is not visible. And then uh, a little bit of research on a very contemporary area and that is driverless cars. How we can use a technology based on electromagnetics to enable cars to drive <coughs> autonomously. And this last the slide, that the last group, I don't think we will have time to go over that today. Maybe that would be a subject for, for the next talk. But that's, that's a very new and emerging area. And we basically are working on ways to explain how cells may be communicating inside our body using electromagnetic waves. Anyway, so as far as the introduction is concerned, most of you are in the area of electromagnetics and thus must be available, uh, aware of these e famous equations that are assigned to Maxwell. The, these are known as Maxwell's equations. Of course, a lot of people before Maxwell's worked on, on discovery of an importance of these equations, how electric field and magnetic fields are um, force fields and their phenomena, the related phenomena, and eventually how they became interrelated through the work that Michael Faraday did. He was an experimentalist. He didn't have 
formal education like yourself in areas of, such as electromagnetics, but, but he was a very sharp uh, and astute person. When uh, he had curiosity, he would go after them, and he mixed that with philosophy. So, you know, a lot of people, students ask me, what does it mean when we say PhD in engineering? You know, where is the philosophy in that? You know, the philosophy is, is embedded in everything we do because that's how we perceive things and that's how we can make discoveries. You know, so Faraday and Maxwell both use quite a bit of that, even though Maxwell was a mathematician, he used a lot of uh, philosophy and understanding of how nature works into discovery of and these equations and encapsulating them in a very compact form that was his contribution that we are all used to right now the first equation of course is faraday's law the second equation care of h equal to j that was Ampere's law and maxwell when he looked at these equations he noticed that the equations are not symmetric and he said maybe there should be really a term similar to that dbdt uh, uh, in 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 Ampere's law to to make it symmetric and once we, he added that then all of a sudden he could explain how electromagnetic can carry with themselves uh, energy and you don't need this uh, let's say fictitious thing that people assume the energy from the sun comes to earth through ether you no longer needed that and that was a huge revelation and from there on these equations became extremely useful and people started to use them in wide range of applications and uh, you know this has been from 19 uh, uh, 70, 1965 to 1973, that's what he was working on this equation. Unfortunately, Maxwell passed away at very young age, but uh, his, his contributions remains with us for many years. I'm going to bring you a quote from Richard Feynman, who was a very famous American physicist. He, he mentioned that from a very long view of history of mankind, seen from say 10,000 years from now, there can be little doubt that the most significant event of the 19th century will be judged as Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electrodynamics. The American Civil War will fade into provincial insignificance in comparison with this important scientific event of the same decade. So um, this is the most successful sets of physical laws that we know today. There is no sets of physical laws that have been verified and has been useful and universal than Maxwell's equation. So, uh, this is this is something to um, to be uh, proud of and and beguile us in terms of the discovery and applications that they have. So. Electromagnetic, as I mentioned, has been with us for a long time, but due to its fundamental nature, broad-based, the research in applied electromagnetic is still very vital and going strong. Um, you know, you are all familiar with the cell phones, cellular communication, before that, you know, the radios, television, they really revolutionized the way human beings, you know, interacted and we uh, affected our society and our culture all of that has been changed because of electromagnetics when you look at it your access to your internet through local area network um, application of ultra wideband system deep space communication uh, we had a mars landing yesterday i don't know if you followed that through uh, nasa jpl that uh, immediately once uh, uh, the probe landed on Mars, they send an image, we receive that image through our deep space communication network. Uh, there are multiple of these 70 meters on ten dish antennas that can communicate with deep space probes and uh, satellites uh, that, that we send to other space. Uh, uh, Professor Sarabandi, sorry to interrupt you once again, that uh, the slides are, the, it seems that the slides are not moving. The, ah. We are still seeing slide two. Ah, okay. Hold on a second. Let me just then ignore this presentation yes. mode and now just 
Yes. Yeah, so let me just show it like this then. This is better, actually. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, the only problem is that I cannot use animation, but that's okay. So I talked about this deep space communication, cellular communication, and um, also in the remote sensing of environment, we use radar systems to probe different things that we observe. For example, Earth has very important global um, processes that are interconnected. You cannot locally measure these things. One of them is weather, one of them is climate, uh, hydrology. Um, these are all very connected pieces that just being at the local place, you cannot get the whole picture. You need to be in the space and be able to probe these processes in a global scale to be able to do things like, you know, what is the soil moisture across the continent because that would provide the pattern of the winds over the land or how do I trace uh, hurricanes? Um, how do I get the wind speed over the ocean? All of these things can be done and probed using, for example, a radar system operating at a specific frequency, at a specific angle, uh, and we monitor the Earth as a whole using a number of satellites. This is a specifically this picture that you see here. Um, it's the shuttle <coughs> radar topography mission uh, that, that we were involved in, and in terms of using the radar to monitor uh, vegetation, do the study of carbon cycles and things like that. The effect of that, of course, the weather change and climate change is huge in terms of melting of the polar caps, droughts that we have observed throughout the years, extreme weather that are extremely dangerous to human and coastal cities and things like that. So we could perhaps monitor these things and understand these processes and once you do that, then you can come up with a remedy. In terms of defense, you know, we can, as I'll show you, surveillance, targeting, the traditional radar that was developed just to find out, you know, whether, you know, an enemy aircraft was approaching or these days, you know, you use that for traffic control at airports, monitoring all the airplanes that are approaching and landing. You can use it for surveillance, targeting. You can do it for homeland security. You know, you can do imaging of people who may be carrying concealed weapons. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work in this area at terahertz frequency. We can do high resolution imaging for detection of melanoma and things like that. Also MRI, it's a very uh, accurate and very high resolution medical imaging system that works based on uh, magnetic resonances of molecular comp biological components and things like that. And you can get very, very high resolution that is used heavily in diagnostic identification of, let's say, diseases inside the human body. So the applications are really, really vast and important as well. So let me a little bit go into details and tell you about, you know, this is a specifically drawn from my own research and my students over the past 30 some years. So remote sensing of vegetation. So why we were looking at vegetation, we called it, you know, a tool for monitoring global warming. What contributes to global warming? is as follows. This is slide that you see here, the energy from the sun enters the atmosphere, hits the surface of the ground, and then uh, the ground heats up. And as a result, you would end up getting uh, infrared radiation, uh, like black body radiation, uh, coming out at infrared frequency. If you don't have the atmosphere and certain traces of gas in our atmosphere, all that reflected infrared can escape the surface of the planet. You know, we have certain um, greenhouse gases that is that are acting like a blanket for our planet, and that's a good thing. You know, uh, people always talk about these uh, um, 
you know, these gases as they always they are bad thing. But naturally, this is designed so that we would maintain a moderate temperature during the day and night. If we remove all these uh, greenhouse gases, the temperature of the Earth would be 30 degrees colder than what we have. So, and especially the difference between day and night. And then imagine that in the morning it's summer, it's hot. Then when it comes, uh, you know, the night, you know, all of a sudden everything freezes. Then all vegetation would disappear and we would die, right? <clears throat> but too much of it is not a good thing because then the temperature goes up and it has adverse effect as well. Um, these greenhouse gases that are most important, you know, of course, the most abund abundant uh, trace is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is generated by multiple things. You know, it happens naturally through, let's say, forest fires. It happens through transpiration. It happens through, um, by, um, you know, uh, other processes, decaying processes of, let's say, vegetation on the ground. And there are also methane that comes from, let's say, swamps. You know, as they decay, uh, they generate um, methane. Methane actually is a very uh, uh, strong um, greenhouse gas. Small amount of that can, uh, you know, reflect the carbon, uh, reflect the um, infrared significantly more than carbon dioxide and uh, nitrous oxide is another one that comes out of industrial operations and things like that. A lot of excess of carbon dioxide right now into the atmosphere is human caused. Also methane that comes out is coming from the industrial, um, uh, you know, poultry and uh, uh, keeping cows and things like that that they produce quite a bit of methane and it's released into the atmosphere and as a result, the temperature can go up. This means that melting of the polar caps, sea level rises, the danger on the coastal cities, and then extreme droughts. I mean, a lot of inland, for example, population, we get our water through melting of the snow that, you know, or precipitation in higher um, altitudes like in mountains. And then during the summer, the summer, they gradually melt the runoff off of that, provides water throughout the year, especially during the summer. And that is supporting that. Imagine that if the temperature is very high and you would never get snow, uh, let's say on the mountains, all that precipitation immediately runs off and in the summer there would be nothing. Uh, to you. So it's, it's very important to figure out how to manage these. Now people are thinking about, um, you know, sequestering carbon dioxide and not releasing it into the atmosphere and, and so on and so forth. But imagine 40 years ago when we started looking at these problems, nobody believed, especially, you know, energy companies, they immediately hired a group of pseudoscientists to uh, insert misinformation into the public mind and saying that, oh, Earth has been uh, hot and warm in many, many years. Was there a question? Okay. No, sir. Okay. So, um, let us take a look at this carbon cycle. The carbon cycle goes into gas exchange between biosphere, atmosphere, ocean, and geosphere. The ocean also has planktons. You know, the biota in ocean can also absorb significant amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then produce vegetation like, like these planktons that, you know, um, the marine, uh, animals and fish can can consume. Vegetation, uh, as we mentioned, has been a major source of sinking or absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Our estimate is that between three to five gigatons of carbon every year is absorbed by vegetation. Unfortunately, we are also cutting trees very fast and uh, exasperating the, and the, the issue. Marine biota also take about two and a half gigatons of carbon dioxide, carbon from the atmosphere and store it in other forms. 
So what releases carbon dioxide, you know, the main culprit here is humankind. We release at least about six gigatons of carbon through usage of fossil fuel burning. We pull it out of the ground. They were stored there before and we release that into the atmosphere. Now you have excess amount of that natural fires, vegetation, respiration, and decay of vegetation in soil, for example, they all contribute to, uh, to excess amount of carbon dioxide in, into the atmosphere. Now, the question that I had at the time was, can vegetation biomass be measured at global scale? Because if we could do that, we could better estimate how much carbon through photosynthesis can be absorbed by vegetation. So we know that uh, there is an atmospheric band. You know, if you look at the absorption of traces of gas into the atmosphere, uh, there is a window, let's say, from one gigahertz to about 10 gigahertz that there is no attenuation of electromagnetic wave through um, the atmosphere. Radars are very good because it can penetrate through clouds. It is not dependent on the direction of the sun. Like, you know, I'm comparing this to optical remote sensing, for example. You know, the reflectance we get from optical remote sensing is significantly affected by cloud coverage, the time of the day, how much uh, moisture is in the air and things like that. Radar that operates in this band is essentially unaffected by um, weather conditions. So we said, okay, so this is a window, we can design radars in this um, band, and then radars at this frequency to some extent can also penetrate through vegetation, and therefore they can probe um, the vegetation biomass. But in order to get this type of information, we need to have a radar with very high resolution, very high resolution that can be as small as few meters on the ground, but these images are taken from space at an altitude of, let's say, about seven to 800 kilometers on a LEO orbit. If you have a radar system that goes around the Earth, let's say it has an antenna with a footprint that is shown here by red, that can provide what we call a SWAT width. So the satellite is going like that, and it observes, let's say, the SWAT width. That could be as high as, you know, a few hundred kilometers. You know, in 13, 14 days, you can use a single satellite to cover the entire surface of the planet. If you have multiple of them, of course, the revisit time can be shortened, and you can monitor certain uh, processes or certain parameters more frequently. But, you know, we cannot make very large antennas in a space so that you could have a resolution on the order of few meters on the ground. In order to accomplish, let's say, a, a an imaging system, we use a technique that is known as synthetic aperture radar. So imagine that I can measure amplitude and phase of the back scatter, and as the radar moves every, uh, let's say, small amount, I would store the amplitude and phase. If I know the trace of my flight, then I can co-process all of these backscatter data that I have coherently, which means I have the phase and magnitude of the backscatter, in order to create a very large aperture, maybe a kilometer length effective antenna, and that kilometer length effective antenna can give me a very short cross-range resolution. The range resolution comes from the width of the pulse that you send. Of course, if the pulse is narrow, you can have let's say, a uh, very fine resolution in range that is known. Instead of sending a pulse, we usually use a chirp and we process that through signal processing. So if some of you have background in signal processing, data, all these things come into place. It is no longer good to be expert in one area. You need to be good in one area, but also you need to know a lot about other areas, signal processing, you know, geology, 
um, ecology, all of those things, you know, if you want to apply your knowledge into other fields, you need to know some of these stuff as well. So um, anyway, so we can generate images like that. This image has a resolution of about uh, nine meters by nine meters, and it's a composite image. We had three satellites on, on the shuttle. This is 1994, long time ago. The technology has been evolving since then. So at L-band, uh, this operates around 1.25 gigahertz with a wavelength of about 23, 24 centimeter. C-band is at 5.3 gigahertz that has a wavelength of about six centimeter. And we are using polarimetry. And I will tell you a little bit about polarization aspect. One of the things that you know our eyes is not sensitive to is polarization of the light that is coming back. But some of you who may wear uh, Polaroid sunglasses, when you turn your head, you see that intensity that enters your you know, retina is changing. Therefore, the light is also, uh, or the reflectance has certain polarization aspect. Nevertheless, as you can see, by combining, let's say, these three bands this way, you know, we can discern some changes. You know, you can see forested areas that are mainly uh, red and green uh, versus blue. Blue uh, edge edge is uh, urban environment or uh, agricultural fields. Uh, you can see these dark spots. That means there was no reflectance. Either there are lake or there are uh, very smooth surfaces. There was an airport here. We can see that, for example. And all this data now needs to go and be interpreted in order to measure the biomass. How much vegetation, above ground vegetation do we have? And every year monitor that and see what is happening, measure locally carbon dioxide, examine the ability of these trees to um, absorb carbon dioxide. If, you know, there is uh, more carbon perhaps in the air, vegetation can grow faster. And these were the type of questions we were trying to answer at the time. There are other modalities with radars. This is also very interesting, and uh, this technique was also invented uh, towards the <coughs> end of uh, 90s and was implemented in year 2000 in a mission that I was involved with, and that was shuttle radar topography mission. With that, we could uh, see, you know, the height of objects above ground. You know, the techniques have evolved since then that we can measure movement of tip of a mountain within a fraction of a millimeter now. We can see the Earth swelling and contracting based on this technology. How does it work? It works based on, let's say, a radar that is transmitting um, uh, like an ordinary radar. Um, this has a transmitter and receiver, so you transmit, it hits a target, it goes back in. There is, in addition to that ordinary radar, we have another receiver that is separated from that antenna by a distance, we call it baseline distance. So if you look at um, this shuttle, this is the radar. This is another receiver antenna that was attached to a 60 meter boom. This was a telescopic boom that extended and came here. So now you could see the direct back scatter. You could also see the signal that hits the ground and is received by the second receiver. Now, if E1 and E2 represent the electric field received by antenna one and antenna two, and you just measure the phase difference between these two signals. So this angle difference between this incidence and this incidence are minuscule. It's very, very small. But nevertheless, there is a distance difference between them. And we use this phase to measure this distance within a fraction of a millimeter or even less. Now, having this distance, if you know the baseline distance and baseline angle, then we can measure the incidence angle from that specific target. Let's say this is a single pixel of the radar on the ground. 
uh, we can measure that angle within a fraction of a thousandth of a degree, right? And once you have that angle very correctly, then you can measure the height above certain reference. So we can use one of the geodetic, you know, uh, uh, planes as a reference and then measure the height of everything with respect to that, let's say, hypothetical surface and map this height of every pixel with respect to that. The important thing for us is relative uh, components of, of these things. So this is an image that was obtained from SAR, and this is in the Michigan Upper Peninsula. These blobs that you see, these are tree stands, and these are river beds and things like that. So we can measure the height of trees directly using this. Of course, you, this is not exactly the top of the tree, the scattering face center is somewhere inside the tree, but that is related to the tree height, and we have to establish those relationships in order to be able to use them. Um, okay, and then another thing that I promised you to talk about was this radar polarimetry. Polarization also plays an important role because in remote sensing, there are always more unknown parameters than the number of measured channels. If, you, if I have 10 unknowns, but if I only have two equations, you know, this is ill-posed problem for inversion. I need to be able to increase the number of measurement channels, and one approach is to use the polarization response. If the radar can transmit both vertical and horizontal, one time I transmit V, it hits a target. The target, depending on its shape, it can produce an electric field that is co-polarized with the incident and an electric field that is orthogonal to that. And if I have magnitude and phase of these two components for EV and, mag and magnitude and phase of those, when I transmit H, the relationship, Maxwell's equations are linear, therefore the relationship between incident wave and a scattered wave is linear. If I have two vector vectors that I'm trying to relate, the coefficient is a matrix and this matrix is purely attributed to the shape geometry and configuration of the target that you're looking at so now if i have a polarimetric radar uh, at least i have these four elements but one of the theorems in electromagnetic some of you might have taken a course in advanced electromagnetic is the reciprocity theorem and if you apply the reciprocity theorem you can prove that in backscatter direction, SVH and SHV are identical. Therefore, if you look at the information content of a scattering matrix, you have magnitude of three of SVB, SVH, SHH, and absolute phase is not that important because we don't know the exact propagation, but phase difference becomes important the phase difference between HH and VV and the phase difference between cross pole and VV, we end up having with five parameters. We don't look at uh, scattering from, let's say, individual pixel with the highest resolution. One thing that is important in uh, radar remote sensing, there is a lot of statistics. Uh, there is a lot of um, random processes that, that you need to be aware of. For example, even within a pixel of 10 meters by 10 meters, there are many, many scatterers there. And each scatterer, you know, have a different location and they produce a little bit of a scattering. As if you are adding a large number of these random variables together in order to get the signal that you want. You're operating at some frequency and then addition of these different scattering from different scatterers, sometimes they are in phase, sometimes they are out of phase, and therefore you would end up getting a phenomena known as fading, and that the statistics of fading is important. You know, one of the things we do in order to get rid of the fading, we get these powers, for example, from multiple pixels, we average them, and then we call that, divide that by the area of the pixel, we call that back scattering coefficient. Now these quantities, if this 
let's say target was a statistically uniform now if you go from one spot to another spot of the same thing you would get the same number and also as a result i know the app you know just phase difference between two uh, polarization for one pixel doesn't have any meaning because again there is quite a bit of randomness there uh, then we need to know the statistics of the phase difference in order to relate these uh, statistical parameters to the physical parameters of the target in order to do the remote sensing. You know, um, at the time, you know, so a lot of statistics for um, this type of thing is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a summation of multiple scatters within a pixel. And if you apply the central limit theorem, you have taken courses in probability, perhaps. Uh, one of the theorem there says, if you have many, many random variables, it doesn't matter what the original statistic is, if you average them, the average is going to be a Gaussian. So a lot of these backscatters that we observe from a radar and their fading statistics follow a Gaussian process. Now, instead of having one vari uh, variable, here we have a vector, especially when you're talking about scattering matrix, you could have a random vector. And this random vector, let's say if you're interested only in VB and HH, VB has a real and imaginary part, HH has a real and imaginary part. And this uh, process, as you see, is like a Brownian motion. Again, you know, for those of you who have studied, uh, statistics and probability, you know what Brownian motion is, you know, if you add up all these vectors that have different phases, you can show that the real and imaginary part of that are going to be uh, identically distributed, the same thing, and they are independent. So the real part of SVV and imaginary part of SVV, they are independent, but they have the same variance, they have the same statistics. So it's true for HH real part and imaginary part, but real part of VV and real part of HH may be correlated. The uh, real part of uh, imaginary part of, uh, let's say, VV and HH could be correlated and so on and so forth. So if you want to find that overall statistics, you know, this is the PDF of a jointly Gaussian uh, random vector that can uniquely be specified through this covariance matrix that is the statistics between let's say different components um, lambda 1 1 lambda 2 2 these are proportional to the power of back scatter lambda 1 2 which is the correlation between real and imaginary part we said these are independent this is zero three four it's zero there are also um, and this covariance matrix is you can prove that it's a positive definite matrix and it's it's a symmetric matrix therefore lambda ij equal to lambda ji also you can uh, know that vv plus hh is also uniformly distributed therefore you can get another relationship between let's say lambda 1 3 and lambda 2, uh, two 3 and lambda 1 4 and you simplify this covariance matrix in terms of only four independent parameters uh, and then i based on that i drive uh, for the first time, the statistics of the phase difference that we can show is only a function of two parameters related to real part of SVV SHH conjugate and imaginary part of SVV SHH conjugate normalized to the power. And this is we call degree of correlation. Um, the sharper this is, if VV and HH were 100% all the time, exactly the, phase, the same phase difference, you would get a delta function. If there is a little bit of randomness, then, uh, you know, alpha goes down. So alpha 0 0.9, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, and alpha zero is uniformly distributed. And the zeta value, which is the mean phase difference, um, it is not just the average of the phase. This is where the PDF assumes its maximum. There is, there is, there should be a distinction. So, for example, for zeta zero, the average phase is zero, but so is the average phase is zero when zeta is 180 degree. So, a lot of people, when they deal with phase, 
they miss this point that you cannot just average because phase is modulus two pi. You have to find out where the peak of the PDF is. Okay, so now there are two different parameters, alpha and zeta, that you can, um, similar to sigma naught value, that you can trace and use it in, in the calculation. So, what is the electromagnetic wave in this? This is a picture I took, you know, at the time I was flying an aircraft. This was a site uh, that we were <coughs> using in northern part of Michigan. This is a mixed forest. Uh, we have to come up with a model. You know, there are wave attributes, radar attributes, such as polarization, frequency, incidence parameters that affects the backscatter. Also, vegetation parameters affects the back is getting like the electric constant, particle shape, orientation, density, and most importantly, structures of the tree. Do you have deciduous trees? Do you have coniferous trees? Do you have uh, palm trees? These will also have a significant impact on the radar back is getting. Even though the biomass may be the same, but the back is getting that you observe is going to be very different and also of interest to a lot of hydrologists uh, is the soil moisture. You know, can we also get the soil moisture and of course the ground underneath is going to have an effect. So, you know, we need to provide a very accurate forward model, electromagnetic scattering model. We need to have purely calibrated data and we need a computationally tractable inversion technique so that, you know, we could uh, input, for example, a physical parameter, we simulate uh, the scattering medium, this is the forest, and then you run your electromagnetic code, and, and you compare that, for example, with calibrated data, you uh, see if these statistical parameters and what you collected from data, do they compare well? If it did, you stop, and then you have the statistical or the physical parameters extracted. If not, you can iterate. But this process needs to be very fast. So this was a tall order because at the time we really didn't know a lot of different things electromagnetically. You know, how does the dielectric constant of soil varies with soil moisture and soil content? You know, soil can have somewhat of sand, it could have clay, it could have different components, and it could have different soil moisture. So we developed sensors, you know, this was a graduate student in 1990s, we developed a ring resonator to measure the electric constant of, for example, uh, that type of soil as a function of um, moisture. So a resonator in air, resonator for dry sand, 10% moisture. When, as you can see, the frequency shifts, which means that the real part of the electric constant is increasing with soil moisture, and also the Q of the resonator is decaying, which means now the attenuation. So from the decay and shift, we are able to extract the real and imaginary part of uh, the electric constant of soil at that particular uh, band of frequency, around one gigahertz, for example. And we did that for C-band, we did that for X-band, and so on and so forth. Also vegetation, we did quite a bit of work to characterize the electric constant of leaves, for example, in C2, in vivo, uh, being able to measure the electric constant of needles, broad leaves, and things like that. We used uh, these microwave uh, reflectometers in a waveguide. This was um, at C-band, uh, or this, this one particular one is at X-band. We were looking as how as a function of frequency from 8 to 12 gigahertz, the real part, for example, varies or how much is the imaginary. Based on this, we developed some empirical models for epsilon as a function of frequency, moisture content, you know, percentage of temperature and percentage of vegetation uh, in there. And then we had to develop in the scattering models for individual components, you know, a broad leaf, uh, but these models had to be computationally fast. So we used a lot of approximate electromagnet based on physical optics, based on 
uh, geometrical theory of diffraction to find out, you know, what this is and then we compare, you know, actual leaves with what our model predicted, for example, uh, sketching from tree trunks uh, over a tilted ground plane in a polarimetric fashion. We use analytical models for doing that. We included corrugation. This is for the bark of the tree and it turned out that, for example, the bark has a stealth effect for radar back scatter because it's providing a matching layer between air and high dielectric constant of vegetation. So it was important to include that effect in there. And uh, we looked at the effect of curvature. We looked at the cluster of, let's say, pine needles. We had models. We did the measurements. And uh, we put all these pieces together. Now, the tree structure itself, if you look at the tree outside, if you were to say, okay, I need to construct that and put it in my model, that becomes very, very difficult. Most the structured trees, you know, uh, follow certain mathematical model. Uh, this is known as Lindenmeyer system. It's a fractal based model. And that is not surprising. A lot of things that happens in the nature, you know, all that information, what tree becomes what, and what the structure it would assume had to be passed on to a seed. You know, how much information can you put in a seed? You know, perhaps if it is a mathematical formula, then it would be easy to pass on that information and put it in the gene so that the tree would generate that structure. So, uh, the fractal, you know, is a mathematical process that it's based on repetition with a scaling. You know, so if you want to generate, this is a 2D, a, a tree like that, a single code like this would generate a complex structure like this. You know, this is, uh, say, that uh, two step forward, put a node, this is a node, another step forward, then put a node to the left, a step forward, put a node to the left, right, and one to the left. And you go through an iterative process. This is first, this is second, iteration, third iteration, after four iteration, you already have a very complex uh, structure. And then you can, you know, go and after you have this mathematical one, if you want to go through Monte Carlo simulation, you give these angles a little bit of uh, statistical variations to get, you know, more naturalistic or, you know, kill some of these branches, you know, accidentally the wind blow it and things like that. There are other information. Next time you're walking in a forest, take a look at a pine needles to see how they arrange themselves around a branch. You'll be surprised to see that these are helical, very precise mathematical helical with a specific pitch. So, you know, we put those things for different species. You know, what is the diameter of this branch compared to the next branch? You know, we found out that there is a law of conservation of area, you know, the area of the previous branch is equal to the sum of the two branches that uh, goes from that node. If you apply these things, then all of a sudden, you know, from a simple model, you can develop a very complex tree structure like a red maple or a red pine and, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is just from a mathematical model uh, that looks very realistic. And then we have a three gen model that you know the user can go put different codes in there we have different codes you just click it you put those randomization and then you can um, generate a, a tree like this and then you can put this tree in a stand and now you know the location of every single leaf branch twig everything in your model now you can do um, scattering calculation uh, then, you know, this is just a model that shows, you know, uh, this is a poor resolution, sorry about that. Um, now that you have this stand, you can put it on a specific topography and you can do, uh, let's say, a scattering from this. Uh, then you have to have soil. You have to have a scattering model for rough surfaces. You know, we develop many, many models. We develop models based on measurements. We call it semi-empirical model. We connected that to analytical solutions. We have analytical solution for the first time. We derive the nth order closed form solution based on small perturbation technique for an inhomogeneous soil. 
we modeled all of these things and uh, you know we compared measurements with our models then you see that for example if you have just the rough surface no vegetation you can you can get those very accurately but then you have to put these in other models then you know so if you have all these sophisticated models but then you need to know that what you are measuring in terms of radar cross-section is actually radar cross-section uh, you need to be able to calibrate the measured data against known targets on the ground we call these radar calibration targets we developed a whole host of this type of target. This is a polarimetric active radar calibrator that um, produces, you know, a specific polarization response. Uh, this was at Elban. This has a very large radar cross section, about um, 45 dB. That is about uh, 50,000 uh, square meter radar cross section. We use corner reflector. This was a very interesting uh, corner reflector that we invented. Now, this is a picture taken from Alaska SAR facility. They made one of the designs we had in their uh, calibration site. Uh, this is a recent uh, uh, radar calibrator that is that was used for the SMAP mission. This has a huge radar cross section, uh, about 10 to the 8 meter square radar cross-section because the footprint of the SMAP antenna on the ground was, was quite large. Anyway, once you put these targets on the ground, uh, this was a, a clear field in, in the area. This is the picture of the area. We put these targets there. Uh, the one that you see is <coughs> yellow. It's a combination of red and green. These are corner reflectors. This one that is white, this was tilted at 45 degree. You had equal energy in all uh, three channels, so they appear as white. And we use these uh, corner reflectors and this park in order to calibrate uh, the data. This is me at much younger age. Um, we also uh, validated, you know, our models before the shuttle mission. We flew. Uh, JPL uh, aircraft that was carrying L-band and C-band SAR and also it had uh, uh, a, uh, interferometric SAR. This is the stand we had. This is the fractal model we developed. Uh, these areas are, are um, uh, red pine. We compared the measured back scatter. These are the measured back scatter by SAR compared to our model um, this is the back scattering uh, this is the i'm sorry this is the back scattering coefficient and these are um, effective height or height as perceived by the synthetic app uh, by the interferometric SAR and we get very close so a lot of these models were also verified before they went into these models one thing i wanted to mention is that when you uh, drive a statistical model. These uh, statistical models become very smooth function of physical parameters. So you can develop a simple empirical model, piecewise linear, for example, or quadratic models that relates the back scattering coefficient to radar parameters and target parameters. And then they are much, much easier to invert. So we use these. In for the inversion, uh, when the SAR flew, you know, we had L-band and C-band fully polarimetric. We applied, you know, our inversion model in order to get certain parameters. For example, this is the map of the trunk height over this area. The dark area is either clear or urban environment. We excluded those. And then we <coughs> get the height map of the tree trunk or this one shows the tree density from the tree trunk and tree density you can basically estimate above ground biomass for example so this is you know just to give you a flavor of you know what can be done of course it's not an easy task it requires significant effort and support from 
agencies and um, to to researchers to do this type of thing. But these are the type of thing that you can do. You know, there are also other things that you can do with electromagnetic. You know, this uh, electromagnetic wave can penetrate to the electric objects, things that are optically obscured. And you can use radar, for example, ultra-wideband radar with fine resolution to go to, let's say, uh, walls, you know, for rescue mission after, uh, let's say, an earthquake, if you want to find out there are survivals there. Um, you can use a radar system, perhaps, in an imaging mode in order to be able to map areas, identify bodies if they are there, or even, you know, stay stationary, measure the Doppler, see if the person is breathing or not through the Doppler shift. Uh, or if you are a firefighter, you know, a building is engulfed in uh, fire, do you want to risk yourself go in there or if you have a radar that can image this and identify whether people are trapped or for security and things like that, hostage situation, uh, the uh, forces can use this technology to find out whether there are people inside the building, whether they would face danger if they go inside or not. This is also a very interesting sort of a remote sensing um, problem, but in a different aspect, because now your environment has changed, you know, the complexity has moved from one area to the other. You know, you, you could have a building, you know, this building could have a periodic wall like cinder block to electromagnetic wave when you illuminate this. Uh, if it is a periodic, if it, if it is a homogeneous dielectric, you know, you would have just a reflection and transmission. But if it is periodic, due to that periodicity, you're going to have significant scattering known as Bragg modes that would come and complicate things. You know, this is the first order, you know, as frequency increases, the periodicity becomes comparable and larger to the valence. And now you start seeing the coefficients of other transmission going through and then you need to keep track of all these uh, rays that would get generated and then interact with let's say objects that are inside the building and try to go back and um, reconstruct the images inside you could have rebar you know if it is a concrete you could have metal inside again this becomes periodic you know you could have so this is for example a building that and we simulated, you know, we have a code called Brick Tracer uh, that uses numerical technique to find out field distribution over the surface of a building block. You know, it could be cinder block, rebar, or homogeneous wall. And then based on the local angle of incidence, it automatically calculates all the scattering in all directions. And then uh, you go through an iterative process in order to find the total field. If you put an antenna outside a building and you look at the intensity of the field, for example, you get this mess. It's, it's very complicated. Now, if you have an object here and you want to trace it, you need to know what to do. You need to understand the forward model and then try to undo that. Usually, the original techniques that we were using, we were, uh, again, using a synthetic aperture. We had a transmitter. We were moving the transmitter. We were moving the receiver around. And from the motion, we were getting a large aperture on both sides. And we were trying to do uh, an imaging like that. I'll show you one example of this. So uh, let's say this is a cinder block wall in the lab. We are putting a corner reflector. This is that pentagonal corner reflector I mentioned earlier on that was used in uh, CERC calibration. This is a small version of that for uh, lower frequency. Uh, in the absence of the wall, if you have a synthetic aperture, if you move your aperture uh, around here, Let's say if this radar moves in front of this wall, you have a point target like this behind it. If there was no wall, you would image it like that. This is a SAR image. You have range resolution, you have cross range resolution. But once you put this wall here, the, the image is moved. Also, it's completely um, dispersed. It's distorted. You know, the response is distorted because of all these uh, Bragg modes. 
But if you know the nature of the Bragg modes and put it into your transfer function, you can compensate for those effects and retrieve that original phase compensated image with high resolution. Um, you can use that same technique, for example, to, um, you know, to do pulse-to-pulse -pulse subtraction. If you look at, let's say, one image that is formed by this, you would get you know, an image like that. You can detect this wall, you can detect that wall. This is a person here. You don't really know if this is a person or is a multipath because of the walls. But there are techniques that we could use. You know, this is uh, scattering from a human body uh, run by FTTD, for example, to get very high resolution and high fidelity model. Um, if and this is the response of human and the building, this is just the response of the human. It's completely suppressed there. You can't really identify that. So what we do in this synthetic aperture, we send the pulse, we retrieve it, we send another pulse, we retrieve it, and then we subtract the two in a hope to get rid of the stationary targets and detect the movers. Uh, and therefore, you know, you go from this image to this image, which now has a much, much better detection of the person. You know, this was supposed to be, I guess, an animation. I don't think I can run it here. Okay, um, then we extended that idea to make it completely robotic. So robots are coming and taking over everything, you know. Uh, you can use this technology and uh, use all these uh, techniques that uh, people in the field of robotics are using and applying it to electromagnetics. Uh, we said that I cannot have a very large antenna inside a building. Let's say you want to go inside a building and find out, you know, doors are closed, find out what is, uh, you know, within that building. We wanted it to get a 360 degree field of view. So the way we do it is by having few um, ground robots that have transmitter and receiver of a radar. So it's a bi-static synthetic aperture radar implemented in this fashion, which is quite interesting. So you transmit uh, a signal and then um, the receiver receives it. But in order to form synthetic aperture, we get the receivers to move and cover this area. Now I have instead of just one trace in a standard synthetic aperture, now I have a plane filled with that. And that plane can be used to focus the beam in any direction, so long as the antennas of the transmitter and receivers are omnidirectional, I can use a back projection technique, for example, to map the wall. So if this is a simple you know, example, you have a transmitter, the receiver can move around anywhere, and collect the biostatic scattering you have reverberation of the rays inside the building, you have direct signals from the object. When you do this back projection, of course you get direct signal from transmitter to receiver, you, you image the location of transmitter very well, you have a lot of scattering from the walls, uh, you have a scattering from the corners, this wall is imaged on this wall and it appears here and so on and so forth. So you get quite a mess and there is also that, that target. However, if you use the radar polarimetry, we know that, for example, uh, the odd bonds numbers uh, or the double bonds numbers can have no cross pole response, then you can eliminate many of these. So this is, for example, a double bonds. This corner is a double bonds. It hits here, comes back. All of those can be eliminated if you use transmit left-hand circular polarization, receive right-hand circular polarization. Also, since these two are orthogonal polarization, there is very little direct leakage from transmitter to receiver, and therefore the dynamic range of the system improves quite a bit. And now you can map the wall, the location of the walls, and a target behind it. In order to do that, we had to invent very interesting antennas. You know, perhaps you have heard of CP antennas, circularly polarized antennas. 
usually these antennas would have a CP response over in the boreside direction, you know, in one direction and over in relatively narrow bandwidth. For this type of system, we want to have an ultra wideband system because I want range resolution, something from one to two gigahertz bandwidth. That's an octave bandwidth. At the same time, I want to have a CP response that is omnidirectional. That is that was prior to this paper unheard of. So we implemented a design. This looks like the a jet engine. Um, each of these fins are basically what we call <coughs> C, um, a, <coughs> a loop and a dipole <coughs> uh, a structure. And we designed this loop filter so that the capacitive response of the dipole is always equally compensated with the inductive nature of the loop. And that's how we get, you know, really, really wide band from this coupled sectorial loop antenna, we call them. And then we are using a number of them. And the, the fact that I have <coughs> this many, because I wanted it to produce the field distribution similar to that of a TE21 in a circular waveguide that has a peak and a an null and with a phase difference of 90 degree. And that goes around the circle in a uniform manner. So these fins are basically um, have a progressive phase and they will produce that field distribution across them in order to create a CP polarization that is omnidirectional. This is the, uh, let's say, axial ratio. As you can see, we have axial ratio of less than two over the entire bandwidth for all angles. Um, and then, and this is also the gain uh, for uh, right-hand circular, if your antenna is right-hand circular, the gain is high. This is the cross pole, it's about 20 dB lower. This is the same thing at different frequencies, core and cross pole for this antenna. You can accomplish 15 to 20 dB of isolation between the two. This is the concept. This is the field distribution of a TE21 mode in a circular waveguide. If you look at the field outside of this, you get V pole mostly here, then you get H pole mostly here, again you go back V pole, H pole, V pole, and then if you have another one here that has H pole, it's 90 degree out of phase with this, then you have a CP basically. And so, and that is how we are adding these two architecture with 90 degree phase shift to get a CP. Uh, this is that um, coupled sectorial loop antenna architecture. Uh, this is the dipole, this is the loop, and this dipole and loop are providing the same um, reactants and therefore they are extremely wideband. So this was implemented, a radar, I don't have time to go through the design of how to synchronize these radars, how to make them compact, we designed them. Initially, we didn't put them on robot. I have that, we don't get a chance to go through that. Um, a transmitter, we move the receiver and we can now map the interior of this uh, apartment it, inside the closet, uh, identifying the door, identifying the pipes that are behind here and everything else that that was inside that building. Um, this was, um, maybe I can show this very quickly. Um, you know, this is, uh, we use actually a quad uh, rotor to read the location of these robots as they move around. And then uh, these robots are move, you know, we have a person, we have a target, we have another target and we generate this image. As this moves on, you see that the synthetic aperture is uh, being produced. This is the location of this wall. This is the location of that wall, this wall, that target is detected right here. This is the wall, that's the person behind the wall. And when it comes here, this wall is more complete. And now this target behind that other wall is emerging. So you can easily see how all these images can be obtained from uh, 
this technique. How are we doing with time? I want to also talk a little bit uh, about this new emerging uh, field. There is significant investment up to about uh, 100 billion dollars already spent with automotive companies and different suppliers to advance the autonomous vehicle. This idea of autonomous vehicle is not that new. The idea, this is a concept. I took it out of an old magazine from 1960s that General Motors were predicting, you know, driverless cars. Of course, technology at the time was not there. You see these passengers are playing a board game while the vehicles are driving themselves. You know, it's been a long way uh, and since then. Uh, this is the current state of the art of the radar, camera, lidars for getting assisted driver um, control. You have automatic cruise control, you have target detection, you have different uh, perimeter for a collision warning and uh, you have camera based for in-lane driving and things like that. So we are extensively in research. We have been in this research since 1990s. The uh, first generation of the automotive radar we developed and we laid the foundation for the phenomenology of how, for example, vehicles with the scatter, what is the scattering from road surfaces and things like that. We also have um, contracts with Ford. We just delivered the first real scene simulator, uh, real time scene simulator of 77 gigahertz in uh, different environment, in a virtual environment, so that um, Ford can assess performance of the radars they buy from different suppliers without driving them. Um, here, automotive companies would not put any sensor on any vehicle unless they have 10 million miles of test data on them. Of course, this is very expensive to do. That's why they are moving into discovery mode using simulations and creating, you know, weird scenarios and repeating those and examining, you know, how the radar works, you know, for a scene like this. Uh, the current technology for radars is not real aperture radar like what I'm showing here. This is a transmit and receive. Actually, this is a radar at 240 gigahertz that we use for phenomenology of next generation radar system. But they use MIMO type radar system where you have multiple transmit, wideband transmit antenna, multiple uh, receiver, and they use Doppler range information to first isolate targets uh, in the Doppler range, we are assuming things are moving, and then once you have the Doppler range, then you would go to this target and look at the phase distribution over your aperture, try to get the angle of arrival estimation, and that is the algorithm used to detect, for example, different this person, this motorcycle, this car, the bus, you know, the traffic lights, uh, that other car that is moving here, and so on and so forth. So we can generate these images almost real time. So why people are looking at millimeter wave? Because, you know, they are small size, we can put them on vehicle, they are relatively low power, they can see through dust, rain, fog, uh, snow, whatever, we can see, for example, things that cannot easily be detected by camera, like wires, meshes, and things like that. If you are inside a building to map a building, we can also get some back scatter due to volume scattering. If you can get high resolution, we can see, you know, uh, find the doors, windows to go in or get out of there. Um, the radar that I'm describing here, this was a radar that we um, uh, designed in, 19, in 2010 or so, and we developed it over the past 10 years. This is a radar on a chip, the whole size of this antenna. This is, a, uh, is about a credit card size, uh, four and a half centimeter by three and a half centimeter, and weighs only five grams. Um, this has 
beam steering capability and it was designed to go on flying robots um, to be able to do um, uh, detection, also mapping, and so on and so forth. The concept is based on using a frequency scanning. You know, this antenna has about uh, 1,200 radiating elements and receiving elements. So it's a huge number of transmitter receiver. That's why we chose uh, operation at 240 gigahertz so that we could make the size of the aperture very small, but then we had to develop an entire technology in order to be able to do that. Um, you know, this is a block diagram of the radar, the antenna system, the active components, and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, in order to do the beam steering, we couldn't put 1200 phase shifters. Uh, phase shifters are very lossy at this frequency, you know, require space, require wiring, requires uh, biasing and all of that. So instead of doing that, we again use physics, you know, similar to prisms that if you shine a white light, the different colors come and separate in different directions. So if you, at the receiver, you have a set of filters, color filters, if you look at only the red, you would probably see the images that are, let's say, um, to the left. And if you look at the blue, that's the images of the targets that are coming from the right. That's how you can basically use frequency in order to uh, scan the beam, but that requires using significant bandwidth. We are at 240 gigahertz, that's okay. You know, we can use 15 gigahertz of bandwidth there. Some of it used for range information and most of it used in order to do beam scanning as a function of frequency. So if uh, you have a meander line to create a dispersive medium, if it happens that at center frequency, these two are, uh, these two radiation are in phase, you get broadside at a lower frequency, there would be a phase lag, and then you would get beam going to the left. The higher offset you have with the center frequency, you would end up getting a beam in that direction. If you go up, then you would get a forward beam steering. So by chirping the signal in a staircase manner, you can do um, ranging and you can do imaging at the same time. You know, of course, uh, this is the design. We have this meander waveguide. The dimensions are extremely small. You cannot machine this. So we had to develop an entire technology based on micro machining of silicon in order to accomplish this, um, to do it in one shot. All the components that the radar required, the entire antenna system, directional couplers, filters, and everything else had to be in here. This design was um, chosen so that we would end up getting a beam steering plus or minus 25 degrees from the center. And the distance between the two patches since we bend over the direction of the electric field uh, is going to be flipped. At center frequency, this has to be an integer and a half number of guided wavelengths in order to get in-phase radiation. And anything, as I said, below would get you a beam to the left and then anything above would get you a beam above. Um, and then, you know, this required to have a waveguide, a coupling from the waveguide. We also need to narrow the beam in elevation. So we use an array of patch, for example, to get the beam narrow in elevation as we are, you know, sweeping in azimuth. So we couple energy from waveguide through a hole to the um, center patch and the center patch feed the patch along the lens in order to narrow the beam in elevation. Uh, when you are dealing with this type of very large number of arrays, in large arrays, 
we always have a, especially over a very wide frequency, there is a phenomenon known as a scan blindness. Scan blindness um, is a phenomenon that happens at certain frequency, you know, when you have these uh, slots that couple energy from waveguide to the patch antenna, you're, mis you're creating a mismatch inside the waveguide. There will be a little bit of reflection there. If you have 50 of them, and at some frequency, all 50 of them may be in phase, and then they add up coherently, and at that frequency, the entire signal is reflected, and then the array doesn't work. In order to fix that, you know, we had to create this reflection cancellation post, place lambda over four away from the slots. Their function is to create exactly the same magnitude reflection as the slot creates, but now it would be out of phase at that frequency where you are experiencing scan blindness. And that way you can eliminate the reflection and then you can operate the <coughs> radar over that. So the, this is a very complex structure. Dimensions of this are like few microns. The, and the width of this slot is few microns. There is no way you can make this using a standard CNC machining. So this is again an animation. I want to see if this works. Do you see this image? Do you see this slide? Hello? Yes, uh, yes sir. Okay, so um, the antenna has three silicon wafers. So we use reactive ion etching. We pattern, you know, there are multiple steps. Here you have uh, active components. So for example, the transmitter chip comes up here. Then you have transition from coplanar waveguide to waveguide. And then you have a directional coupler. This feeds the transmitter. A portion of the transmitter comes here. It goes to a receiver. We have a filter here um, designed. All of that structure is designed using just etching silicon and it's done in clean room. And uh, you, this is the lower wafer, and then we have a medium wafer. Um, this medium wafer has basically uh, trenches for the patches. So now the patches would go along here. There is a slot here that couples energy from the lower waveguide up. You would get the center patch fed, and the patches are in air. So, because, you know, we can, if you use a substrate at 240 gigahertz, most of the energy would be going out into the uh, substrate. And, and for that, we had to suspend the patches over air, and we designed basically these patches over um, <clears throat> a paralene, uh, which is a very thin uh, membrane, and then we placed that membrane over with a very high precision over, let's say this, and that becomes the entire antenna system. These are different components. Maybe now I can just escape. Um, these are different components of that waveguide that uh, I showed you. And they're fabricated, you know, gold plated, and then we go through gold to gold compression bonding. This is um, uh, the patch elements on that membrane. The membrane was placed over here. These are all the photographs. That's the slot, the 65 micron uh, energy is coming up. This is the radar system. That's a um, coin, that's a quarter, American quarter, 25 cents coin um, that is shown to as a reference. And the entire weight of this radar was 4.4 grams. Um, we characterized this radar at 240 gigahertz. We had to develop different techniques for probing, uh, and then we do near field scanning of the antenna. And then uh, once you do that, you can see, for example, um, the radiation pattern as a function of frequency, 230, 237, 240. You see the beam is scanning very nicely. I think behind that, again, I have a animation that shows you the actual beam steering. Um, um, I don't know if you can see this one. So if you notice, as we change the frequency, 
This is the actual measured beam of the radar. Uh, is scanning in a space in a range of plus to minus 25 degree. This is the fixed elevation pattern of the radar, which is about seven to eight degrees in elevation, and that doesn't change with frequency. Uh, okay, I guess I am running out of time, so uh, we can maybe just conclude and then have uh, some time for questions. Um, you know, as I showed, research in applied electromagnetic is, is very strong. We have computational EM, we have medical imaging, in energy, wireless power transmission, you know, we have applied this technique for oil exploration, detection of, for example, how far the fracking goes, and um, at very low frequencies, we have designed antennas that very, very low frequency based on mechanical antennas, based on super miniaturized elements. EM base, uh, uh, EM is very, very important because of its fundamental nature. And it can be applied into many interdisciplinary activities. Uh, and I think at the end, you know, until we find another means of transferring power data, electromagnetic field remains an important discipline. And uh, I encourage you to pursue your research in this area and contribute as, as we go forward. And with that, I'm going to stop. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Sarabandi, for this informative talk. So you have discussed the polar polarimetric radars along with uh, different uh, radar imaging results uh, and also various uh, radar environment analysis along with current state of the art of uh, electromagnetic applications. And, uh, so I hope uh, audience enjoy this very engaging talk. And once again, thanks a lot. Um, for taking your time and giving this uh, talk. So, uh, audience, uh, so if you have any uh, queries, uh, you may unmute yourself and ask a question uh, one by one. So, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Thank you so much, Professor Sarabandi, from your very nice presentation and your great work. Uh, I had a question regarding that 240 gigahertz radar. Uh, first of all, what is the main application of this radar band, this band of radar, and also how do you fit your uh, structure? Yeah, so um, application, as I mentioned, is for uh, navigation, robotics. So uh, here for autonomous vehicle, you know, we would like to have as many radars around the sides of the vehicle as we can, just to be aware of the situation. How far is your the closest, you know, vehicle to you or an object or obstacle to you? You need to um, use that information in order to manage your driverless cars. Bigger radars are expensive and bulky. And we design these radars basically to uh, be as small as possible and, and make them um, affordable. Um, so how do you come? Yes. How do you compare them with the on-chip antennas, and how we can integrate this solution with the CMOS receivers? Yeah. So uh, you saw that uh, there are places where you can uh, put the CMOS active elements in in there. There is an integration place uh, in one of these uh, maps I showed you. Um, so, for example, these holes that you see uh, from it's a flip chip a CMOS chip that comes from here and gets connected to a CPW line that is here, and that's how the active components would get connected to this antenna, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it's uh, a similar one on this side for the receiver, for example. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, so there is one question in the chat box. Yes. So uh, the Basri Basu is asking, uh, kindly explain the relationship between the complex dielectric permittivity of the human body tissues and uh, the EM wave propagating through this. How to characterize the waves in that case? So, 
any references of a paper or book uh, that explain this phenomena, um, yeah, you can yeah. suggest. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, again, you know, the electric constant of biological material is a strong function of frequency, mainly due to the spectral behavior of the electric constant of water. You know, most biological tissue contains significant amount of water, and, and that the electrical water plays a very important role in characterizing. So there are theoretical models for that. And also, uh, if you don't like theoretical models, uh, we usually measure. So the measurement has been done at lower frequency using open-ended coaxial probes by measuring the phase of reflection coefficient. Um, it's an open-ended coax. You can consider that as a capacitor that can be filled with the dielectric material. You, you connect that, let's say, to a network analyzer, measure the phase of reflection coefficient. From that, you can find the dielectric constant, or you can put, you know, that similar to that ring resonator against the body to measure that at discrete frequencies. At higher frequencies, we use open-ended waveguide. We model a dielectric um, against an open-ended waveguide from, again, the magnitude and phase of reflection coefficient. We extract dielectric constant. So that, there are different techniques that people can use in order to measure, and most of the models that are out there are based on mixing formula, how much of biological material, how much of uh, other components are, are included. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is uh, one more question uh, from Yi Zhu. So he is asking, uh, could you simply explain uh, what do we usually do to improve the accuracy or the resolution of remote sensing, especially uh, when the target are extremely small, complex, or moving in a very high speed? So uh, right. do we really? Uh, do we usually improve the antenna structures on the satellites or do we focus on the signal processing algorithm? Yeah, I, I, the answer is yes. You know, you, you have to do whatever is affordable in order to get the result. So once you understand, you know, how much signal to clutter you have, how much signal to noise you have, then uh, you have different options. You know, for example, for satellites that are trying to find a needle in a haystack, you know, a small target, for example, uh, from space, you know, what you need to do, use different modes of SAR, like a spotlight SAR. As the satellite moves, you maintain the beam over that spot in order to increase the processing gain. And that's, that's one way of doing. The other thing is that you tune your Doppler filter, if it is a moving target, you you can tune your filter to those Doppler. Anything that goes and has a velocity like that would shine better. So that is signal processing technique. So you have to use everything that is available to you in order to improve the result. Yes, sir. I hope this answers his question. Uh, we yeah. can take uh, one last question, uh, then we can conclude. So, uh, Biplab, uh, he is asking, uh, can we expect antennas at terahertz frequency in the coming future? And what applications can it be used? Is uh, is the fabrication feasible? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we can design antennas at any frequencies, you know, up to infrared, you know, hunt. we have done antennas here at 180 terahertz. Um, that's not an issue. The issue is characterization of these antennas. The issue is uh, the, are the sources and receivers um, that has been lagging because, you know, um, electrons are too slow, I guess, when you go to those frequencies over the material and the photons are um, um, too fast. Uh, you know, devices that are working in optical frequencies are fundamentally different than devices that operate at, let's say, lower electronic frequencies as we use semiconductors. You know, these uh, holes and electrons in semiconductors are too slow to respond. The issue has been basically how to get the electronics to work there um, as 
you know, the techniques based on photonics don't work very well in the terahertz range. Designing antennas is easy, applications are many. So, you know, for short range communication, you can do backhaul of, you know, terabytes of data in seconds. You can have uh, medical imaging with terahertz uh, for, you know, skin and things like that. There are, um, you can do atmospheric sensing, you can do, let's say, uh, gas chromatography, you know, for detection of different gas traces in atmosphere, for air quality, for uh, detection of hazardous air uh, contaminants, you can uh, do, the, there are many, many applications, you know, uh, it's just getting that technology to work is, is, is a challenge, but, you know, things are moving forward. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir. So, uh, I would like to uh, thank you once again, and uh, I hope uh, we'll be having another session with you in future uh, at IIT Kharagpur. And uh, so, thank you once again, and I will, uh, I'll ask uh, Professor Ghosh uh, if he has any comments. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Sarabandi, for responding to our call and uh, uh, for your very, very informative and uh, insightful presentation. Uh, uh, many of us learned a lot from your presentation, and we really would hope that uh, uh, if you can spare us some time when the pandemic ends, if you could pay us a visit, uh, we'll sure. be very, uh, we would be highly uh, pleased to uh, host you here and uh, for uh, future talks uh, uh, we would be uh, uh, requesting you and if you could spare some of your very valuable time to uh, illuminate us on your research activities uh, absolutely absolutely thank you thanks yeah it was my pleasure to uh, it's always good to talk to students and uh, and be an inspiration, hopefully, you know, this talk, you know, maybe it was too fast to learn, but my goal was to really open your eyes into possibilities and give this talk so that it would inspire you to do research and uh, be persistent on your research and do the best you can do for your research, your all graduate students, or maybe some of you are practitioners already. Um, uh, and help the human society as a whole to for us to all to go be able to go forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah. You too. Okay. Thank you. So Bye. we'll conclude the session now. Thank you all for attending.